keynote speakers. The first keynote speaker is Chris Thompson, Director of Clean Growth at the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, BASE. He was also a director of the labor market before at BASE and also had a role in consumer rights bills in BASE. And before that, he also took on roles in the higher education policy in DFE and roles in HM Treasury. Chris' mission is to deliver emission reduction while seizing the econ economic benefits of the low carbon transition. And today he will tell us all about what the challenges are in delivering the energy transition and especially which type of challenges he sees for the UK. Therefore, thank you very much for being with us today, Chris Thompson. You have the floor right now. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and helping to open the uh, conference, even if it's only virtually. Um, as uh, Jamila said, I'm Chris Thompson. I'm director of uh, the Clean Growth Team in the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in the UK government. And essentially, my team is responsible for setting the overall ambitions for the whole UK economy in terms of the greenhouse gas reductions we want to achieve. And then our, uh, my team monitor and look at uh, what we need to do to actually meet uh, those uh, challenges. Uh, today, I'm going to briefly outline the, um, uh, the progress that the UK has been making, uh, the challenges that uh, we've still got ahead of us and some of the uh, actions that we've been taking. And I'll, I'll finish on uh, what I see as the role of evaluation uh, within uh, some of that context as well. So um, the, the UK, is, uh, as many of you will probably know, has set a, a uh, emission reduction target for its greenhouse gas emissions to be net zero by 2050. The, the chart on the, the left in this slide shows that um, we've, we've made, historically over the last uh, few decades, we've made significant strides towards that. So we've managed to grow uh, our economy uh, as strongly uh, as uh, the other uh, G7 countries, but managed to also at the same time uh, 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 achieve significant reductions in, in, in emissions. The, the chart on the, the right here gives it a bit of a feel for how that's been derived. Where have those savings been, come from? And you can see that the energy power sector has delivered a very substantial contribution to that. And we've achieved that through uh, much greater use of renewable energy and the phasing out of, of coal, uh, coal power. Uh, we've also seen the business and industry sectors uh, uh, make a significant uh, uh, change and uh, reduction. We've seen greater en energy efficiency in the transport and housing uh, and building sectors, but they've been offset to a certain extent by volume increases. So, for example, uh, greater volumes of passenger journeys or a greater numbers of, of homes and, and buildings being constructed. But I think that also helps to begin to show that the size of the uh, challenge that it really does have to be a cross economy uh, reduction from now on to 2050. We can't rely on uh, one sector to provide a lot of those uh, reductions. Now, every sector, every part of the economy is going to have to uh, decarbonise. The UK has um, set uh, legal limits along the way to achieving uh, the 2050 targets. We, we call those carbon budgets, they're legal uh, restrictions we've placed on ourselves. And uh, this charter along the, the bottom axis sets out the, uh, the, the periods of time that we've legislated for so far to limit our uh, reductions up to 2032. And um, the black lines in the chart show what those legal limits have been and you as you've seen progressively they've been coming down uh, the blue lines show where we think the uh, either the outturn what we've achieved in terms of 
uh, emissions or where we're projected to. And you can see that we think up to 2022, we'll keep meeting our, um, our, our uh, goals that we've set ourselves, but we're off track currently, really for most of the rest of the 2020s, we've got much further work to do to, um, to bring our emissions down. Uh, if we do nothing, we'll exceed our targets. Uh, also, uh, the stretch is actually going to be even greater than that. Uh, in order to uh, uh, meet our UN commitments and the wider global efforts on the Paris Agreement, we've committed at the end of last year to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 68% uh, by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. And in practice, that means going even further than the little black line uh, on the carbon budget five, the 2028 to 32 period, we've, we've made that stretch even greater. So one of the things that we have done to um, uh, try and start closing that gap is uh, an announcement at the end of uh, last year of uh, the, the, by the Prime Minister of the 10 point plan, as we call it. And it was significant for a number of reasons. It, its breadth, first of all, it brought together actions from across many sectors and also enabling actions such as innovation, finance, to, to try and get an integrated approach to tackling uh, the challenges we've got. It also integrated our growth ambitions with our um, industrial growth ambitions, which is something the UK has not always done successfully. And it announced significant new public investment combined with funds to incentivise and galvanise private investment uh, into uh, the sectors and technologies that we need. I'm not going to go through all the 10 points I did pick two examples. So for example, on point one, where we have um, uh, uh, commitments on advancing our offshore wind capacity in the UK, uh, as alongside that, we announced a £160 million infrastructure uh, fund for our ports to try and grow the, the supply chain and capability to make sure that we can uh, achieve the, 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 the physical, the technical capacity we need to, to grow our offshore wind. Uh, on transport, we announced the ending of uh, new petrol and diesel cars and vans from 2030. But alongside that, we announced investment in electric um, battery technology and also vehicle charging infrastructure. And the 10 point plan also set out how our carbon reductions and support other priorities in government as well, such as what we call levelling up, making sure that um, all regions can uh, potentially benefit from the uh, energy transition that we need to go through, and also what some people call the just transition, making sure that individuals, households, businesses uh, are um, treated fairly in terms of their contribution uh, to this agenda. The other thing that uh, we uh, announced again at the end of last year was uh, an MG white paper. And it set out a number of things. First of all, the transition to net zero, how we'd actually fulfill our ambition to fully decarbonize electricity supply by 2050. And uh, in there, we have a work program to prepare the energy system for that transition. For example, we have plans for new strategic guidance to our energy regulator and also legislating for opening up more competition in our onshore uh, energy networks as well. Like the 10 point plan, it also uh, covered how our policies were supporting the green recovery, jobs and investment. And it also covered, uh, if you like, the just transition, the kind of fair deal in this case for consumers of energy and uh, uh, for example, we announced the expansion of the warm homes discount to cover more people in the country that helps keeps bills, energy bills affordable for people. So we're making significant progress, but uh, even those policies in the 10 point plan or the energy white paper, they don't close the gap of what we need to achieve and this significant effort across all sectors. 
So one of the things that we have planned this year, and we want to try and achieve all this ahead of the COP26 conference towards the end of this year, is to have clear strategies of how we will decarbonize in each major sector. And uh, some of the strategies we're expecting to publish, I, I put up in, in this slide here. We want it to culminate in a net zero strategy at the end of the year, and that will bring together all our sectoral plans that will aggregate up all the efforts to show how we're, we're keeping to our pathway of net zero and how we'll meet our commitments. And it'll also bring together some of the cross-cutting issues, such as jobs, skills, uh, investment, that are actually needed to be mobilised across uh, all uh, of our sector plans. I'm going to finish just to talk briefly about the role, as I see it, of evaluation uh, in, in this transition and in trying to help meet uh, the challenges that we've got. Um, I've set out just at the top of this slide uh, three areas where evaluation is very important. I don't think that's new. I think they always have been and always will exist. You know, it's important for policy design. It's important for winning the case. Uh, for public investment and understanding uh, the role of uh, attracting private investment if that's necessary for a project. And, and ultimately, uh, as a policymaker, I'm really conscious I have got accountability that I've got to show for the decisions that we've taken and evaluation must play a key role in that. I, I do think, though, that our challenges for policymakers are, are growing and and some of that is transferring onto the role of expected valuation to play. And I, I've given some examples here. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly mention a couple. Uh, complexity, uh, it's obviously getting harder to take decisions uh, in uh, without thinking about how the effect will interplay across sectors. I mentioned that every sector now will have to decarbonize very significantly. And they impact on each other. I mean, the obvious one that uh, people often refer to is the uh, role of uh, in transport of electric vehicles and the impact that will have on the energy system. And I think evaluation will need to look cross-sectoral much more in terms of its impacts and, and, and trying to understand and inform future policy in that sense. Certainly in a UK context, uh, our, U our fiscal policy means that we will have to justify more than ever the investment that we need to make in decarbonising. And evaluation obviously has to um, uh, play a key role in that. Net zero also uh, means everyone in the economy, businesses and individuals are impacted and we need to understand the impacts on an even more diverse range of people and organisations, and also justify and convince of the need to change to that more diverse range of people and organisations. And again, I think evaluation is going to be absolutely key to that. And in the UK, as I said out earlier, it's equally as important as carbon reduction for the UK uh, policy as, uh, as it is to show that our net zero investments are having a greater impact on a wider range of policies, such as jobs, levelling up and investment. And evaluation needs to help us uh, measure those impacts more robustly than maybe we have done in the past. And I see that as one of the, the big challenges personally that I've got in, in my current role. I'm going to finish um, by just uh, mentioning some of the things that we've done to help embed, embed evaluation in our policy making. It's obviously a mixture of very formal things and less formal things and incentives. Um, uh, we, we have um, uh, on the formal side some specific government guidance that um, policy makers, uh, analysts, social researchers have to follow. Um, where our interventions are based on legislation, we usually have to commit to our parliament to a post-implementation review, which again reinforces the requirement to have evaluation. The spending review, the, the process the UK uses to allocate funds across its different priorities, uh, formally requires evidence, and ultimately that needs to rely more and more on strong evaluation. 
And also there's, there's various sources where we're scrutinised about the decisions that we take. I've put one example up here of the National Audit Office, an independent body outside government that uh, looks and publishes very public uh, reports about uh, decisions we've taken, uh, investments we've made, and the way that we've delivered on projects. And then there are a number of uh, obviously informal and uh, in, uh, incentives to improve the, and, and make more central the role of evaluation. I'm just going to mention uh, one here, and that is um, uh, we're trying to increase the amount of data and analysis that we share with public bodies outside of central government, such as regulators. And we think by doing that, it should improve the quality and reach of evaluation, particularly if we can link up and use more data sources to uh, improve the capacity and uh, reach of evaluation. I'm going to uh, finish there. I, I hope that's been a flavour of some of the challenges we have in, in the UK. And I'm happy to try and answer questions later. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and please, uh, audience, uh, pose your questions. We will take them up after the presentation of Hans de Bruinix. And please make sure you ask your questions, uh, naming the presenter you would like to pose your question to. And please do that in the Q&A. So having said that, I would like to introduce Hans de Bruinix. Executive Director of the European Environment Agency since 2013, and he is also head of the EVA Research Institute in Leuven, a uh, institute specialized in policy research, and he is head there since 2010. Now, Hans conducted research in more than a, a dozen countries. Areas included environmental politics, climate change, and sustainability. And therefore, he knows a lot about European policy and can really uh, provoke us with tantalizing opinions, etc. Hans, your talk will be about what role does evaluation play in accelerating the progress. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Yamilia. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly pleased to be uh, amongst the community of evaluators because I, I've got a background in evaluation myself that I, that I will mention uh, as I go along in the slides. J just uh, as, as part of the introduction, I am no longer at the University of Leuven. Actually, being the director of the European Environment Agency is, is a full plate already. So. Uh, I, I quit that job when I, I took this job, but anyway. Okay, um, I think the, the start of uh, the discussion has to be that we are in a situation of business as unusual, yeah? You all know this graph, it's the last uh, four decades of the average temperature on the planet, and especially after the turn of the century, we see uh, a, a rapid and con consistent increase in that average temperature. And I think it's important as evaluators to not just look at uh, the business of evaluation as a technical issue or a methodological issue, but to understand the context very well in which we are doing it. And so the, the sort of key question is uh, in this uh, business as unusual context, uh, what, what does that mean for evaluation? Yeah, can you go on with uh, evaluation business as usual or do, do you need fundamental change there as well? To frame it in yet another way is that uh, the context in which we are evaluating the energy transition is a context of unprecedented challenges, but also improved knowledge about those challenges. And, and I will just mention the climate change issue, which is central to your community. At the same time, we also know that we're facing a, a biodiversity loss like we have not seen before, uh, uh, especially not when in, under uh, conditions of, of humans being uh, the main impact on biodiversity. We also know that we are facing a crisis of unsustainable resource use, which is studied primarily by the International Resource Panel at the global scale. And there is a strong connection to health issues. So this is also part of the context to uh, evaluate 
and make policies in the energy transition. And the messages here are clear. Huh? There is a sense of urgency there. We are in a pivotal decade, huh? so uh, is stated by scientists and increasingly by policymakers. We're facing irreversibilities already. Um, we are dealing with a context of tipping points, which means mechanisms that have been put in motion that uh, are reinforcing each other. And we are dealing with a strongly interconnected, uh, complex system of systems here, you could say. So this is the context in which we conduct evaluation. And I think it needs to be reflected in evaluation. Another part of the context is that we notice that the so-called efficiency paradigm, which I think together with fighting pollution as a paradigm, have been driving policies for decades now, but they have only brought limited gains. Yeah? For, for a long time, we've been hearing, and it has been supported by good evaluation, uh, and I emphasize good evaluation, that technology is becoming more efficient, that we are coming with uh, policy approaches that emphasize efficiency in the existing systems, and that that would deliver the type of results that we are aiming for. Well, I, I think these graphs on a global scale show that that is not the case in, in, in our material footprint, but also not in greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, uh, when you are talking to the youngsters, the, the Fridays for Climate and others, and they look at you as an old gray man and they say, how long have you been discussing climate change globally? And you have to say, well, since 1990, actually. And uh, what's been the result? Well, 30 years later, we have more than 60% more uh, greenhouse gases. And then they look at you and they say, is this really the best you could do? Yes, but we are more efficient and we're, you know, so it becomes a, a difficult discussion to have in the broader context. If you move away from the sort of evaluation of particular policies or particular programs or particular technologies, you, you get a rather complex picture. And of course, we also notice that in sectors, yeah, we have, you could say, at least 20 years of efficiency policies in uh, the mobility sector. Well, they have not translated in uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions in mobility. Yeah? We've been mainstreaming environment and climate objectives in the food system, in agricultural policies. Well, th that has not delivered uh, really strong results uh, in that system. To the contrary, it's been stable for a long time now. So we really need to question at a more systemic level, what is it we are evaluating and what does that mean for advice to, uh, for future policies. <clears throat> well, if we then look at current European uh, objectives, uh, the European Green Deal ambition is rather clear. Uh, we, we need to move to net zero emissions, which means that the European institutions are now discussing the minus 55% uh, proposed target for 2030. And that means that we about need to triple the annual uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, reductions. Yeah, uh, that, that is that is a big uh, step forward, and we need to move away from the current target, which which would leave us in this efficiency paradigm, perfecting what we have today. But the new ambition, I think, is prompting systemic change. And then the question for an evaluation community becomes: Are the current evaluation methods really focusing on systemic change? And, and what does that mean for methodologies, for the type of data that we use, uh, and, and also the forward-looking nature of what it is we are doing? Because a lot of evaluation is good at evaluating the past, but uh, the sort of ex ante or at interim logic of strong policy evaluation uh, becomes a more and more pressing issue. Now, when we look at some uh, elements like the, the renewables in this whole story, we, we know that uh, from a counterfactual analysis, which is an evaluation type analysis, that the breakthrough of renewables indeed have, uh, has contributed to uh, the pathway towards 
carbon neutrality and especially the transition in the energy system. So the, the type of uh, analysis that we have done here and then translating that in light of a 2030 objective, which is not an end goal, but a stepping stone to 2050 uh, becomes a real challenge when it comes to methods and, uh, and messaging. Yeah. Also, the, the complexity is, is growing when you start to link uh, and look at trade-offs. Um, so it's clear that uh, renewables are not impact-free. Yeah? And uh, when you look at land occupation, for example, uh, we, we know that the trade-off with biofuels and biomass is uh, large. Yeah? And uh, that has not always been taken into account in our policies. When we would have done what some wanted us to do 15 years ago in biomass, we would have seen an enormous uh, trade-off. Eh? And the more systemic question is even whether it's the best idea to use virgin agricultural land to grow primary crops, to then mix them with fossil fuels, diesel or other fuels, throw them in a 19th century technology called the combustion engine with on a good day an efficiency of 25%, to then use a car individually owned with on average 1.4 person in the car to drive below 10 kilometers on average. Yeah, uh, there must be a better solution yeah, for the mobility system and the energy use in that system. So framing uh, an evaluation in a, in a systemic context and then asking the questions of trade-offs uh, is, is, I think, increasingly important. So then the question becomes, what does this new paradigm look like uh, in terms of technology, in terms of the whole system around it, fiscal matters, uh, which have been mentioned by in the first uh, introduction as well. What does it mean in terms of, mean in terms of infrastructure needs, uh, personal habits, ownership regimes, all of that. So that all becomes part of the broader question. I think it's also important that uh, as people looking at policy and, and, and evaluation as part of that, that we, we look in places that are not so evident. And I think a lot of what we've been doing is to look at uh, the transition curve that is intrinsically optimistic, uh, how, how we start from experimentation, we accelerate through upscaling, we look at policies that are doing that then the institutionalization thereof, the results of that, and we hope to end up at a higher level of sustainability. But I think it's at this moment, given the urgency, equally important that we look at what we should stop doing and phase out, yeah? and how we can move away from an optimization uh, paradigm and, and look at what we need to phase out. And that will mean looking at how systems are breaking down, how certain technologies are phased out, how certain practices enter a destabilization phase. And, and are we really looking at that as evaluators and, and people observing policy? Because that is where a lot of the conflicts arise. Yeah. And that is where we will have to be careful in coming up with enabling conditions uh, to speed up and scale up. And also the space for the breakthrough of the right uh, practices, technologies, uh, funding schemes, the space for them to really break through faster and be scaled up will depend partially on how quickly we phase out of where we are locked in uh, in the current system. So that is important. And that means also that when we look at investments, we need to have uh, an eye for what are investments that we've done a lot in the past and that have been evaluated as positive investments. That is the marginal efficiency gains in the current systems. And any engineer or economist will tell you that marginal efficiency becomes increasingly expensive and is tangential in nature. And they will not lead us to net zero emissions. And the danger is that we will in be investing billions in what will lead over time to stranded assets. And by the way, also to stranded regions and to stranded workers. Yeah? And that cannot be uh, the goal. So investments in the future that look at 2030 as a stepping stone and how they are connected to the sustainable finance methods that we are developing in the taxonomy in Europe, how this relates to budget, 
uh, discussions, and I focus on the EU budget here, but also what it means uh, that the European Investment Bank is stepping away from uh, fossil fuel investments and how that is tipping the investment uh, community and what that means when we are evaluating future uh, prospects for energy transition. A last point that I would like to mention is that there is a lot of talk now about the social justice part, uh, leaving nobody behind. That is the, the phrase that is uh, used by nearly everybody now when they talk about the transitions. Yeah. Um, I will not dive into the, the, the map here. We did some work on uh, linking uh, poverty uh, to exposure to air pollution, which there is a close link to the energy system. But in general, I think we need to understand that this social dimension is largely underdefined. Uh, what does it mean to say leaving nobody behind or social justice? There is a poor knowledge base for that. And I, I would claim also a rather poor methodological knowledge base for that. Uh, it is linked to fundamental debates on distributional issues. And uh, it is, uh, I think, linking Europe to the rest of the world as well. And if I might be uh, so, so blunt, it also means probably connecting largely fragmented and isolated evaluation communities. Yeah? I, uh, I am, uh, I, I dare to say, one of the, the, the drivers behind the European ev ev Environmental Evaluators Network, which is meeting every year in Europe. Um, there is very little overlap with your community, whereas in the policy and especially in the understanding of the systemic nature of the challenges that we are facing, it's high time that these communities connect, that they connect methodologies, that they understand uh, how they can jointly look at fundamental uh, issues uh, that, that require a systemic and integrated uh, approach. Yeah. So that is, of course, where the Green Deal comes in and where we need to make these connections. As zero pollution has a link to the energy transition. Circular economy has a link to the energy transition. Biodiversity definitely has a link to the energy transition. Yeah. So uh, th there are a lot of connected issues and fragmented communities of practice uh that that remain in their own bubble and under corona we know the concept of bubble better than ever is probably not not the way forward so i think we need to question ourselves as well when we look at our own uh community yeah? and so the key question and this is the the, the final slide uh, that i'm showing is that if you look at the green deal through the lens of a political economic and investment priority for europe a systemic transition logic, a link with sectoral policies, but in a very different way than before, the interconnected nature, the long time horizons that are in there, the social dimension, the link with innovation and digitalization, but also an implicit governance agenda. How do we as an evaluation community respond to this? And I count myself as part of it. In my academic work, I, I did quite a bit of methodological work on evaluation i did a number of evaluations myself and part of the work of the european environment agency is also de facto evaluation work so we are facing a challenging uh, time i think in questioning whether what we have been doing is adjusted and adapted to the urgency to speed up and scale up the systemic transition that we are looking at i will leave it at that thank you and i'm happy to